unfortunately, a lot of people bring children in the world and they're not fit to be parents. And they wonder why society is the way it is. Well, one result of that is babies having babies. People who are at the legal age of adulthood and they're physically capable of reproducing children or conceiving children, yet mentally, they may be 21, but mentally they still at like the age of 12. And they're not ready for a child. And yet they bring these children in the world because they're not prepared. You know, a lot of these young men, they go on back out there about their business and they leaving this young lady with the responsibility to raise this child. She's still a child mentally. So, you know, there you have it. And then you throw in easy access to things that can destroy you, like drugs, guns, alcohol, impoverished uh, environment, all of that, broken family structure. All of these are remedies that lead to destruction. And we see this a lot. Yet my heart cries out to all the children in the world, any child on the planet that's suffering unnecessarily or just suffering, period. As I say, children are innocent. They don't ask to come here. And as men, I think it's our job, you know, naturally, regardless of what your profession may be that you use to, as a monetary means of gain to provide food, clothing, and shelter for you and yours, I feel that the job of man is to teach and to be a guide for the youth that come behind us. That's what I feel our whole purpose is on the planet is to learn, study life, and all that life has to offer, yet give it back by teaching and rearing the next generations that come after us. Who are we, no matter what we accomplish while we're living, if we don't have nothing to give those that come in behind us? You know, you have some people like that, they want to live their life and just be the greatest that they can be and go down in history and be the greatest and you never gave back nothing to nobody. Now, every jewel that I have, I'm gonna born myself into other young men. I'm gonna born pieces of Lock Kim into other young ladies. I've done that through my music. I do that from being a member of this nation. Even now, I'm active in a program that we have here, here in North called the North Street Academy, where we work with disengaged youth from North that uh, the high schools and remedial schools have given up on. They send them to the street academy where they can no longer tolerate them. And what we do is re-engage them back into society. A lot of these young men and women come to us with fourth and fifth grade reading levels. Uh, and uh, they go through our program. And over the past five years, we've had an 80% graduation rate. These uh, young men and women have uh, acquired their high school equivalency diplomas. There's no longer a GED. They have an equivalent of a high school diploma, and a lot of them have went on to be successful and productive people in life. So, you know, it's just certain things that I'm dealing with, things that I'm dedicated to. Just being a member of the 5% Nation, we all about giving back to the youth and teaching truth to them and leading by example, you know. So I lead by example, by example just by remaining righteous, striving to eat right, exercising, working hard, uh, stress and education, and just teaching, man, you know, communication. Like I said, communication is the key. We can solve all the problems in the world through proper communication. Some people don't want to communicate. You got some people, like, the world has to be, well, how could I say this? Just like in the time of a great flood, or when we watched the movie of a Noah, Noah was the best Noah of his time. Noah was having these premonitions from a higher source, letting, guiding him, letting him know what needs to be done. And I have these internal thoughts. Your mind talks to you too, just like we having this conversation. I'm pretty sure the little inner voice in you is speaking to you right now, just like minds are speaking to me. And what it lets me know is that there's a war going on in the world. The world is between God and the devil. God only represents good orderly direction. The devil represents the doers of evil. The two can't exist. One gonna have to be triumphant and one is gonna have to lose. I know that positive will overcome the negative. So being that God is good orderly direction and the devil is a doer of evil, 
I'm going to stay on the side of good orderly direction. I always tell people that just remain good, remain orderly, and go in the right direction. We learn right from wrong as children. You know whether or not you headed in the wrong direction in life. You know whether or not you're headed in the right direction in life. I ask people this. They say, why you ask me that? I say, are you God or the devil? They say, what are you talking about? I say, God is good orderly direction. The devil is a doer of evil. Which one are you? They say, huh? I say, two people on the planet, God and the devil. Which one are you? God is good orderly direction. The devil is a doer of evil. You know whether or not you do evil. What is a doer of evil? A liar, a thief, a stealer, somebody that's always up to no good. We've all met people like that throughout life. I could pinpoint a million of them. This guy, he just never up to no good. He's a doer of evil. And it doesn't have nothing to do with skin color, pigmentation, ethnicity, or nothing. This is human behavior. You have people who are good orderly, directed people that just work hard, don't bother nobody, just want to enjoy life. They're good people, whether they're religious, whether they're atheists, whether they're five percent of Muslim, whether they don't have no religion, whether they don't even believe in God at all. Good people that just work hard, don't bother nobody and want what's best for them and their family. Voila. Then you have these people that are doers of evil, literally. People that want everybody to do the work for them, but they want to take the credit. Or people that want to pit people up against one another, have a fight and kill them one another for they selfish gain or leave what happened. We've seen it. It's not blind. These things exist in the world. So that's that's my, uh, one of my breakdowns on God and the devil. And I teach that to the you. I tell them, man, good orderly direction versus doers of evil. The good orderly director is going to remain triumphant. You always do. I tell people, the truth and the lie won a, had a race. The truth won, yet the lie took its place. The <laughs> truth and the lie had a race. The truth going to remain triumphant, yet we live in a day and time where the lie took its place. And until we learn the difference between the truth and the lie, we're going to be forever Traveling like this, not knowing what's going on, you know. But yeah, I mean to go all over the place with that, you know. You know, for well, some no. reason, I went into that conversation. No, it's very important because I've been fortunate that since I was a little kid, I knew what I wanted to do, and I've stayed on mm -hmm. that path because I love rap as a little kid, and I was been able to knock on wood, still be involved in it, and. Mm -hmm. But I've met a lot of people even my age now that don't know what they want to do with their life. So they're spinning, like you said, and that, right. you know, that leads to a mental spin, a job spin, a personal spin, a, just everything. Mm -hmm. um, that's that. But with pure righteousness, back to that again, the, mm -hmm. uh, one of the other things that always interests me with you and many others, of course, but like Sample the Dope Noise, for instance, that song. Mm -hmm. Because I would say most people think of you as a five percenter, a political rapper, a conscious rapper, pro-black rapper, whatever. But if they listen to Sample the Dope Noise, your flow, your lyrics, how you're stacking rhymes, all that different stuff, just showing your lyrical prowess, how do mm -hmm. you, how do you uh, kind of balance being a super lyricist, super flow with having... <laughs> heavy messages and not losing that because I think mm -hmm. a lot of people don't, a lot of people when I talk, when you've come up, they don't think of you to me the way I do as both. They, mm -hmm. look, they look at you strictly political. One way. Yeah. Right. Well, that balance just come from, that balance came from uh, my heavy influences in hip hop. Like, I was heavily influenced by T. LaRock. Kumo D, Grandmaster Cass, uh, Tito from the Fearless Four. A lot of these guys heavily influenced me and they showed a lot of versatility. So it goes back to, you know, me being a member of the 5% Nation, young in the nation, still young in the lessons at that time. That's what was on my mind. That's what was resonating from me. And because that's what was in me, that's what came up out of me. However, 
me showcasing lyrical skills on other songs and stuff was just me showing the world that hold up. I know I'm coming out with this black is back and all this powerful stuff for us. We're striving to uplift my people and 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 uh referencing certain teachings and things of that nature from the lessons that we study. I still wanted to show MCs and hip hop, like, yo, I could really do this though. You know what I mean? Put all of that to the side. We could go bar for bar and I, and I could hold my own or whatever. <laughs> Okay. So I just wanted to show that balance. That's all. Gotcha. Well, I think I think you did it and and did it very well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Now, how did you find with say like a smooth yet hard when you're with Apache? How did you find going back and forth as a writer? Did it um, when you knew you weren't going to do a whole song, for instance? Did that? Mm -hmm change how you wrote did you feed off apache when you were writing like how does that work yeah for you? well actually me and apache did a lot of writing together so a song with me and him on it going back and forth it's like that's like practice for us we would always do that in, in mark's basement me and apache were actually the two members of the flavor unit that actually did a lot of writing we did a lot of writing for latifa Patchy has written for me and I've written for him. So a song like that coming together, it was just, we, we always gel together like that, me and him. Okay. Definitely. Always gel together like that. So, you know, with, even with him working on his album, we was working on Latifah's first album, me and him was there, pinning that pad. If she needed something, we did. That's our sister, you know what I mean? Okay. She was the sister in the group. And if she needed a rhyme, she had a deadline, no problem. I got you, sis. We hook it up quick. And he was the same way with me. Like, if Apache had a deadline on a song or a verse or something, yo, lock, I need help. I'll whip it together. I'm the same way with him. Yo, Patch, I got to do this song. Yo, 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 check this out. So we worked very well together, him and I, definitely. So at that point, you know, you've been in the game more than a year going on two years close to it or whatever as far as professionally mm -hmm. you know did you at that point see a difference between how tough city operated and then tommy boy operated with apache and naughty by nature of course definitely so, break it down that's when i thought <laughs> of course i started realizing that even before my second album i realized that i quote unquote didn't sign such a good deal and uh after after Lost Tribe of Shabazz, I've been took notice to how Latifah and Tommy Boy, well, how they were treating her, how Apache was being treated to Tommy Boy, and I also paid attention to how other artists were being treated at labels that they were on, and that's when the reality dawned to me that, yo, I got to get up out of this tough city situation because he's not really taking care of me. You know, I actually signed a real bad deal over there. Uh, it took me about three and a half years to get up out of that deal. I actually did it on my own through the help of my lawyer and um, ended up not having no or Aaron anything. If anything, um, Aaron probably owes me royalties to this day, if anything. But the deal that I signed was one of them bummy, crappy deals that probably Frankie Lyman had or somebody. Yep. Like I said, back then I was just happy and eager beaver wanting to get on. Yeah, it taught me a valuable lesson, you know what I mean? But I learned from it, and I have no regrets. I'm grateful that even with Tough City Records, I'm doing an interview with you right now. So he put my music out there to the world, and it got me recognized. So I'm, I'm grateful to Aaron Fuchs for that, you know? Aaron Fuchs paid for me to do a video in Egypt. To this day, I'm the only artist to ever film a video in Egypt. So I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that even with the business aspect of Tough City not being so great, I was still able to get music out there. The world is familiar with me, and I can I will always be grateful to Aaron Fuchs for that. Always. Also, uh Aaron, I could call Aaron to this day. And I say, Aaron. I need a box of some dope 45s. He'll call me and give it to me. Aaron Fuchs, no beats. <laughs> he knows records. You'd be surprised. Aaron Fuchs always has known records. There's been times where I would go to Tough City Records 
and he would give me a box, and they would have 45s, and I say, what's this? He's like, there's some beats in there I think you might like. I go to the studio on them beats. Dope as fuck. I'm like, Aaron knows record. So in his defense, like I said, I'm grateful. I have no regrets. You know, I, I was able to make a name for myself, lock him Shabazz, to the point where one of the most prolific rappers on the planet mentions my name to this day in interviews, and I'm forever grateful. You know, Eminem, he keeps mentioning my name. So it had to be something about my music that affected others that came after me. And for that, I'm grateful. And I'm grateful for Tough City and Aaron Fuchs for putting it out there to the world, you know? Gave me the opportunity. It wasn't a big purse behind me and whatnot. I didn't have a lot of money backing behind me. Yet, at the end of the day, I put out music and the people are familiar with me to this day. And I'm forever grateful for that. So what's up, Aaron? <laughs> Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a fifty thousand dollar car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, Bob, on your TV basketball? Yo MTV has just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.